Great to see so many of you here, uh, San Jose, for the, the second summit. Um, I'm wearing the, you know, the t-shirt from Hot Chips Days. It's getting a bit threadbare, but uh, I think it still looks good. Reminds me of the very first time we pushed this out into the public. Um, so I'm going to give the State of the Union, and what we do in this segment is sort of more of the technical underpinnings go through what's been happening technically uh, in the foundation. Also, just some thoughts about how we should be doing things. Uh, so I always like to start with the origin story. How many of you, um, this is your first time at a summit or workshop? Wow, okay. So this is your one slide, uh, catch up slide. Um, how did RISC V start? Um, so back in 2010 at Berkeley, we were doing the, the Parlab project and we needed an instruction set. And we wanted something that was simple to build because I was working with a small group of grad students um, had to be efficient. We were focused on low power design, efficient uh, architectures. We also wanted high performance. Um, had to be extensible. The whole goal of the research there was building customized processors to do various tasks. Um, and being academic and wanting to work with others, we wanted to share what we did with everybody else, mainly academic colleagues we were thinking at the time, so we could build infrastructure, build devices, get results, share it with our colleagues. So, when we looked around thinking about what ISA to use, um, we figured out, well, no existing ISA really meets our needs. So this is when we decided to go create RISC-V. And so I'll give a shout out to the uh, original inventors, so Andrew Waterman, Yun Sup Lee, Dave Patterson, and myself. And since then, there's been many, many other people have helped us with the ISA, but these were the original uh, creators. So we built this for ourselves, and it turns out something simple, efficient, extensible that you can share. We weren't the only ones who wanted that. It seemed to be a few other people thought that was a good idea. So many others wanted these same things, and that's kind of how this whole movement began. So from that initial rollout in 2014, we started in 2010. In 2014, we went to Hot Chips with these t-shirts, went around promoting RISC V, and that's really when it started rolling out uh, to the wider world. Um, and the, since then, there's been very rapid uptake uh, everywhere at RISC V. So a quick timeline, I'll just go back, give you a quick history lesson. So 2010, we started the project. The first tape out of RISC V was actually in 2011 in a 28 nanometer FDSOI technology from ST. It was a 64-bit core. Um, it actually ran RISC V instructions um, of that first version. Uh, the first rocket chip, rocket chip is a well-known open source implementation. The first tape out from there was in uh, 2012 and so on. So over time, we built the chips. We did the compiler ports. We did the operating system ports. Um, and in 2014, we decided the ISA was kind of ready for uh, uh, pushing out there. So that's when we went to Hot Chips, proclaimed we have ISA, frozen ISA version 2.0, and gave it to the community. And uh, the first workshop was held. There's a big response at Hot Chips. The first workshop was held beginning of 2015. Um, and in that same year, later that same year, the feedback from industry was, we cannot rely on a university project. There has to be a more stable home for this. And that's why we created the foundation in 2015 to be an independent nonprofit to manage this standard. Now, some of the major milestones in the early days of RISC-V, the early days being a couple years ago, um, when in 2016, um, NVIDIA announced they'd selected RISC-V to use as a controller and all their GPUs. That was a major endorsement from a uh, you know, leading uh, computer architecture maker. Um, and the first commercial soft core started appearing then as well. Uh, at the end of 2016, Sci 5 produced the first commercial SOC. We could actually go buy a RISC V chip. It was a small microcontroller, the FE310. Um, another big announcement uh, Martin, who's sitting here, announced in 2017 that Western Digital is moving their entire product line to RISC V, and so on. And since then, my slide would get filled up if I made every announcement that's happened since then, but I just want to point out these key early ones that help with the momentum. And so, the first Linux SOC came out from Sci-5. The first summit, we grew so much, we needed a bigger venue. So we did the first summit in uh, last year, uh, workshop then. And big news, as I'll get to, is the ISA specs are now all ratified. Those original specs from 2014 have now been ratified. And here we are um, at the second summit. So there's been this progression of uh, out of Berkeley and going out to the whole world uh, development of RISC-V. So what's different about RISC-V? Just to recap, well, it's very simple. We wanted to keep it simple. That took a lot of work. Um, it's a clean design. We wanted to do lots of kind of research and not be bogged down by any assumptions about how we're gonna build this thing. Um, it's a very modular design, designed for extensibility. And we wanted it to be stable. So we, we kind of like to build a modular ISA, then freeze it. And we enhance the ISA by adding new modules instead of uh, 
developing those old ones. And the biggest difference is really is community design. It's free and open. We wanted to share this originally, coming from the academic roots. And now this is uh, a big differentiator with this ISA. The whole community gets to work on what's the ISA roadmap, what are the new features uh, that are going to be coming out. So how does RISC-V work? How does the ecosystem work? Well, the foundation sits at the middle, and they provide the standards. So one confusion I always like to try and clear up is RISC-V is not an open source processor. RISC-V is an open specification, right? And the foundation manages the specification. Now, because the specification is open, and this spec is describing this interface between software and hardware, because the spec is open, it means you can have open source cores. So because you have an open spec, you can have open source cores, and there are many of them. There is not a RISC-V core. There are many available open source cores out there. Not only open source cores, there's also commercial cores. These are commercially um, supported, verified, guaranteed, you know, the company will support you putting these into the SOC, just like any other soft core you get from anywhere else. The only difference is it's done to an open standard, right? So you have many vendors. So at this point, RISC-V has more commercial IP providers than any other ISA in history. As well as the open source and commercial cores, some companies choose to build the cores themselves, and that's fine, that's allowed too. So in the NVIDIA case, they're building the cores themselves. Western Digital has built their own cores. They also happen to open source those cores as well that they're using on their products. Um, so the other side of the coin is software. So the real value in RISC-V land is there's a common hardware and software interface, and all the software ecosystem is porting to that common interface. So the open source community have been great at adopting RISC-V. It really matches their philosophy, their ethos. There's a lot of energy in the open source community to bring all the software on board to RISC-V, and that's been great to see. And so RISC-V is basically a mainstream architecture in all the important upstream projects. But it's not only for open source software. So RISC-V is also being used by, uh, is being supported commercial by commercial software providers. So companies who provide tooling, for example, Lauterbach, Sega, IER, these kinds of companies, they're commercial tool providers, they're also coming in to support RISC-V. So again, RISC-V is not only open source. Because it's free and open, it enables there to be a, a vibrant open source community, but it also supports commercial community as well around RISC-V. So why is it so popular? So I always have to remind people, why is it popular? Um, especially when I'm talking to a crowd of engineers. Um, so, you know, it's not because some benchmark ran a little bit faster or something took a bit less power. That might be true. Um, but it's because there's a new business model. So in the old days, when you were trying to design a chip and put a core on there, first you go talk to all the vendors, figure out a vendor, pick a vendor, and you got their ISA. And then if you did a second generation of that chip, you're kind of locked in. RISC-V changes this now. First you pick the ISA, you say, I'm going to use RISC-V. Then all the vendors have to compete for your socket. And the next generation, they all compete again. And that's the advantage of having a standard interface. It really empowers the, 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 the customer. Also, you can have freedom. You can add your own extensions without getting permission. Everybody gets a RISC-V architectural license for free. That's how it works, right? You can do your own design. Now, you may look at RISC-V and do a point-by-point -point comparison. On my current project today, I see this core here, this core here, and do I do RISC-V or not? You know, maybe there's some you know, performance gap, area gap, power gap, feature gap. Um, the reason it's popular is people can see it beyond like current implementations. They can see where this is going. So any, uh, what's lacking or missing in RISC-V, or if there isn't a core that's at the performance power point you want, just wait a while, this is all gonna get fixed. There's tremendous momentum as we've seen behind RISC-V. And so the people are moving to, to RISC-V, they're seeing this coming. They're gonna see this is gonna basically take over the industry. And one, one piece of evidence for that, um, Semico is an independent research company. They recently uh, prepared a report, uh, and they uh, gave some highlights from that report. Um, so they went around and talked to a lot of people to, in a lot of industries, and they're forecasting 62 billion RISC-V cores in five years' time shipping. That's just incredible, right? When I saw this graph, I thought they, they left a zero, added a zero or two, but this is what they claim. 62 billion cores in five years. This is an independent research company. So that's what we mean by widespread adoption. It's not necessarily very visible right now, but uh, believe me, there's a lot of people working with RISC-V. So our modest goal has been, you know, we kind of joked about this at the beginning. We just want to be the industry standard ISA for everything. Um, and you know what? It's happening, right? So this is actually happening. Um, and it's happening far faster and across more domains than anybody predicted, right? It's just happening at an incredible pace. 
Um, and the other thing is there's demand at every performance level. You shouldn't think about RISC-V as just a microcontroller IoT thing. People are really asking for everything from those tiny chips to what I call ludicrous chips, right? The big, massive, highest performance parts you can imagine. So there's demand across the whole space. Now, the other part of this, there's demand for every feature that's ever been done in any ISA ever, right? Everybody wants everything in RISC-V land. And that's cool, that's great. Um, but it means there's a lot of work left to do, uh, both on the hardware and on the software. Okay, so success is great. This is a great problem to have but it's still a bit of a problem. We've got to keep up with this, this demand at the foundation. So the good news is in 2019, that the foundation of the foundation is in place. We have the base and the standard extensions have now been ratified. So that means the whole community has agreed on what is this base risk five thing. And by that, I mean the, the basic unprivileged instruction extensions, the privileged architecture, uh, the base memory model, uh, debug spec. We've adopted the sale formal spec as a golden model. Um, the compliance suite is imminent, like Callista said, um, and there's substantial upstream software support. So basically, it's at a very stable base is already in place now, and now we can uh, start furnishing this house and building a lot more features in there. So growing RISC-V. Um, so I think one thing to be clear, we designed this base, I say, to be simple, efficient, extensible. We never thought that would be it. Like we never thought, when we said we froze the modules, we said this piece of it we want to freeze. We never intended that to be the end of RISC-V. That's it, done. We're all back to doing something else now. We realized there's going to be continual growth. So there's a large variety of extensions being pursued in the community. And you know, there'll be thousands of instructions in RISC-V land eventually. Right? So the risk part, you know, it will be a reduced instruction set in the terms of it's a nice design, but there will be thousands of instructions eventually. But the important thing, you'll always be able to build a simple core with just that original RV32i and have all the software support for that simple core. And that's what's important about the simplicity in RISC-V, right? You can run the whole stack on just that initial bare ISA. Now, one thing I, as we're looking at this re regime now of adding all the extensions everybody wants, people worry about um, fragmentation versus diversity. This is a slide I've been using to try and hammer home the point. Fragmentation is a bad thing. And to me, fragmentation is when there are two ways of doing things for no good reason, right? It's just, why do you have these two different ways? Just a waste of human resources. The example I like to use is left-hand drive, right-hand drive cars, right? Steering wheel, you gotta direct the car which way to go, drive on one side of the road. For various reasons, people pick one side or the other, and now we have to support two kinds of cars. What a waste, right? This is a kind of, but on the other hand, diversity is when you actually have a different problem to solve. So if you wanna go across town a mile or two, bicycle is a great thing to do. Right? If I want to carry 500 people across an ocean, I probably don't want a bicycle. I maybe want something more like a jumbo jet. These are very different problems that will need different solutions. Right? So just because there's a big diversity in RISC-V does not mean there is fragmentation. Fragmentation is when one thing is being done in two different ways. So along these lines, I want to sort of explain a bit more how we structure RISC-V standards. This comes up repeatedly in the, the task groups and as new people come in, to try and understand um, how we build RISC-V. So we have the ISA specs. These are things like, these are the set of instructions. This is what they do. There's often a set of options and features. And when we develop a new subset, often there are subsets of the subset and smaller subcategories. And people think this is very complicated. You know, can you just make a simple choice here? But the goal is that ISA specs, they're all meant to be a coherent set of uh, design that works together. You can plug all the different extensions together as you want to, and they should all work together in a coherent way without conflicts. That's the goal of the ISA spec design. It's a separate task to build what I call a platform. Now, a platform is something that should be driven by the software ecosystem. So it's really up to the software community to say and select, we're going to port all the software, but we require all the implementers to have exactly this set of features. So the platform spec is what takes the pick out of all these ISA specs puts it together and says, this is what I need to give you a portable software uh, ecosystem, All right? So uh, just to kind of hammer this home, I'll do a little example. Um, so say, you know, in RISC-V line, let's just pick the, a set of ISA modules. So RV64i, these are the basic integer instructions for the 64-bit version. And we've defined a bunch of additional standard extensions, M for multiply divide, A for atomic, F for single precision, D for double precision float, and C for compressed instructions. So these are a set of ISA specs. Uh, 
They all work together. You can put them together in a system without conflicts. And now, those big single letter uh, names, uh, within them, we actually define subsets. So within multiply, you see, well, there's some multiply instructions, and there's some divide instructions. Some people complain about, I don't want the divider, I just want the multiplier. So can I just use that piece? In atomics, we have uh, read, modify, write atomic instructions, and we have load reserve store conditional synchronization instructions. Some cases you may want one and not the other. Those are subsets of A. As we define new extensions, like the vector extension, we define what's going to go in the big letter V, the standard set of extensions. There are extensions that are being thought of as we develop that base on top of V. So VEDIV is an extension that sits on top of V. It's not part of V, but it sits on top of V. And the bit manipulation extension, similarly, we have sub subsets and uh, extensions. So these are a set of specs. Now, software doesn't target this whole universe of specs. Software lives within some ecosystem. So for example, in Linux, back in 2016, 2017, uh, the Linux developers were asking us, what should they port to? Well, this is a confusing world. What should we build our system for? So we kind of told them this, RV64 IMAFDC. So this gives a simple story for Linux land, allows them to make progress, and knows what's going to be there. It also puts a requirement on the implementers who want to run the standard Linux distributions. You better do all these things, because otherwise your stuff won't work. So this is the contract between the software ecosystem defining this platform that lets the hardware implementers know what they have to include from that universe of modules in their design. Now, in the case of Linux, it can be very constrain constraining. For example, they will say, you cannot use V, because the OS doesn't know how to save and restore that state in this version. So there may be a, a later version that we do that may allow that. Now, if you flip to something in the embedded space, typically in the embedded space, you want a lot more customization. People really want to optimize, remove every last spurious gate from their design, uh, add some things that are specific to that task. But you may be a FreeRTOS developer, for example. So FreeRTOS, this isn't a real example. I'm just imagining they had a 64-bit version. They said, what you absolutely must have is the base I and also atomics, because I want to support synchronization. You can have multiply, divide, and M. We'll give you ways of incorporating that in your code and using it when it's available. You can have the other things. We'll give you ways of incorporating that when it's available. So these are options the platform provides, right? So coming back to Linux 2020, so in the future, our future instructions to Linux community will please build distributions for this bigger set. Now we have vectors, now we have bit manipulation. So the ISA family's grown, there's more stuff in there, it's more capable, and we want Linux to take advantage of that um, in that future design. So these are different platform specs, so Linux 2017, Linux 2020, I don't know what we'll eventually call these names, it'll be more likely server, you know, server um, platform. But this is the idea that each of those software communities decides how they want to use those ISA specs that makes their life easier. The whole goal of RISC-V is to enable a large, rich, uh, vibrant software ecosystem. And they do require standardization, taking out options. Even though the hardware implementer is like, oh, this is really hard to implement. I don't want to do this. Can we please? No. You, hardware, there's about 100 times more software engineers than hardware engineers. And there's a reason for that. There's a lot more software to write than hardware. So you want to make, um, make use of all that software by supporting these platform specs. Okay. Another topic that comes up, well, you're trying to do all this, but how are you going to avoid fragmentation? There's so many companies, so many organizations, everybody's trying to do their own thing, and is this going to cause a mess? And what I see is, no, it doesn't. And I sort of figure out, why is it not fragmenting like people expect? And I think what people forget about, there's two very powerful forces that keep fragmentation at bay. Um, one of them is the users. So people are putting RISC-5 in their chips. Uh, they do not want to repeat a vendor lock-in. They're not dumb enough to go just use stuff that's only available from one company, right? The whole point of RISC-V, it's an open standard. The second big one is software. So no one, not even nation states, can build software stacks. It's a worldwide effort to build uh, software humanity relies on. Um, and so upstream open source projects, they're only including things that are ratified or frozen or ratified by the foundation. So if you want to do your own thing, you're on your own for software, and that's a big lift. Good luck with that. Right? So these are the big reasons why standards are important, why I don't think the community will fragment. Um, these are very powerful forces that people seem to ignore when they're worrying about fragmentation. Right? So we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of new things to add. Like I said, people want every feature that's ever been done in any ISA ever in RISC-V in some form. Uh, we have to make a more 
principled uh, decision on which ones we do include and when. Um, and one thing is there's a lot more work to do. So one thing, as the foundation is growing, we're growing the organization to manage the standards. Um, so we're looking for a, a CTO type person, somebody who's independent, employed by the foundation to help manage the technical uh, standards process. So, um, and that person will be in charge of what we bring in as this technical steering committee. As we change the structure, the board is gonna grow. They'll be more administrative. The current board is a fantastic set of technically capable people. I'm sure the remaining board will be, but there'll also be busy people who won't be focusing on the technical part of the standard. So the goal is to have the technical steering committee take over more of the day-to-day, -day, what should be done next in the ISA level. And there's three kind of organizations we're putting in place there. Uh, there's sort of three forms of group that work under the steering committee. Um, so the task groups are the things we're most familiar with. That's the way we've been doing these ISA modules. And they're still there. They're an important part of what we have. Um, then we have the standing committees. Some of these topics, initially, we just had to do the first one. Then we realized, oh, this is not going away. For example, the privileged architecture. We finished 111. There's a bunch of features, one for 112, 113. This is a long running process of continuing to track what needs to be added to the privileged architecture. So we have a proposal to put in a standing committee that's gonna manage the privileged architecture. Similarly for debug and trace. We have debug ratified, we have work on trace, various kinds of trace. I don't think we'll be done anytime soon. People want new features. So the idea is there's a standing committee who oversees the progression of what happens in debug and trace. Similarly for security. Um, as well. And these standing committees help inform the whole committee and suggest task groups. So the task groups can be done independently as well. But that's the model we're, we're pushing on to try and make it a bit more scalable in how we do these things. Um, and so the idea of the task group, they're supposed to be finite tasks. They have a concrete deliverable. They should be done in a certain amount of time. And so little units of work are given to the task groups. But the longer vision is managed by the standing committees and the whole steering committee as a whole. Another thing we've added recently are the SIGs. And the SIGs uh, special interest groups, and we had a request for, you know, there's these cases where we want to just promote RISC V, work with outside people as well. It's not a standards effort, it's more making sure issues are addressed. And these may eventually result in more internal activities, but we've already set up a few, the FPGA, um, looking at impact of decisions in the ISA on software implementations for FPGAs. Uh, there's a safety um, SIG who's just interested in how we're going to address functional safety in RISC V, talking with outside people, the community, trying to figure out what we should do inside uh, uh, the foundation, possibly set up a standing committee around uh, functional safety, for example. There's also an effort on HPC, uh, led by the European guys who have been very uh, uh, keen to push RISC V into HPC, but open to everybody to, to work together on RISC V for HPC. What does it look like? What are the concerns? Okay, so these are... Um, how we're structuring the standards part of the uh, RISC V organization. Um, so another thing we're doing is developing a written standards process to try and make sure everything's done through the correct steps and also coming up with a lighter weight. We have so much work to do. In some cases, there are small things we need to get done that people pretty much agree on. We want to make those have a sort of pass, fast path to get through. Um, and one thing is all the members should be on the, uh, the global tech mailing list. So. If you're interested at all, any technical part of RISC V, you should be on tech. And you remember, tech at list.risc5.org. And some of these discussions will only happen at that top level. So if you're only in the task group, you won't see a lot of discussion going on at the, the, the global level. And it's not a high, high volume mailing list, um, but you, you should definitely join that list. So the standards group, we have a lot of activities. This is kind of swim lanes of some of those uh, task groups ongoing. Um, and so this is really the ISA roadmap uh, for RISC V. Um, what I want to do now is quickly, because I don't have too much time and it's quite deep, go through some of the highlight and progress in the different areas in the standards and what we're planning on doing next. So big, big news was the, the formal spec. Um, having the, everybody agree to use SAIL as the basis, the current SAIL version as the basis of the RISC-V formal spec, and all new modules will be added into this formal spec. So now we have a, a formal machine-readable description of the spec. You no longer have to pour over the the LaTeX document to figure out what this spec means. It's now being uh, formalized. Uh, and the, the great thing is supports, including the memory model, is captured in this formal model as well. Um, and this will replace the textual spec as the ultimate authority about what is RISC V, go look at the formal spec. That'll tell you this. Um, so there's been a lot of interest in learning about this. So uh, Nikhil will be running a tutorial on the formal spec on, uh, on Thursday at 9 a.m. Here, here at the summit. 
Uh, at this point, I'm going to pause and just say, the kill has been a stalwart leader of this, this formal spec group. And as a result, all this hard work is done. He is the winner of this year Foundation Directors, Board of Directors Award for Technical Leader. So, to kill. Go find him. So, uh, this was a very, very difficult process, and we, uh, th so I'll just read the citation. So, this award is for his leadership and technical contributions in the ISA formal specification and compliance groups. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, so, compliance. So Nikhil not only worked in the formal group, also worked in compliance. He's been an incredibly valuable uh, member of the community, so very well deserved. So the compliance tests, we have versions up and available, um, including tests for the, the bit manipulation and vector extensions. Um, so throughout this next segment, I'll be going through the different uh, components, and one common theme will be more help is needed uh, on doing standards work. Everybody wants everything done, specified. Uh, they complain they don't like it, but uh, we need a lot more people actually working on making the specs, it's hard work. Um, so just go through the bit manipulation extension. This adds various bit twiddling instructions to the ISA. Um, and we're in the pro process of get, this is in the end stages of reaching consensus on what exactly is in B and what's in optional subsets. I think that uh, pretty soon, the beginning of next year, we hope to push this into the ratification. Um, the vector extension, uh, this is the very big extension. It's bigger than everything else put together, basically. Uh, and it's meant to provide a very scalable uh, vector unit from very tiny systems up to very large systems. Um, and we're releasing the 0.8 version now at the summit, um, and things are definitely uh, converging uh, very well. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, assembler uh, functional simulators available, including compliance tests. Um, there are multiple implementations in flight. You'll hear about some of them at, at the summit. So there are multiple companies building to this spec. So this will be the foundation of high-performance uh, RISC-V number crunching. Uh, this vector spec. So we anticipate freezing this by mid-2020. There's still a lot of work on the software side. We want to make sure the software is happy with what we have before we freeze. So the hope is by middle of the year, we can freeze and ratify towards the end of next year uh, the vector extension. Uh, the PACSIMD extension, this is designed for small machines where you just want a little bit of fixed point inside the integer registers. Um, and we have 0.9 releases out there, including toolchain. And the work, again, is going on there in arranging uh, coding and arranging the instructions into subsets. And again, we expect to ratify this by uh, towards the end of next year. J extension, the people focused on support for dynamically managed languages. You could say J's for JIT, but the community there prefers to call them dynamically translated languages. Um, the main topic going on there is actually a new mechanism for instruction cache coherence. So we initially had a design in the, the original design at a fence.i instruction for instruction cache coherence. And that's really too heavyweight for a lot of systems, a lot of scenarios, especially when you're doing a lot of jitting. So uh, they're working on a proposal for a better instruction coherence scheme. Uh, fast interrupt group, we're developing uh, low latency preemptive nested interrupt support local to the cores. Um, uh, one difference here from other solutions is we're trying to do a bit more in software to help support the wide range of ABI software ecosystems that are likely to run on this. Um, we're sort of in the, in the space, again, of refining details about what go, comes in and out of the base profile. The kind of main design has been there for a while now. I hope to ratify this in early 2020. Uh, the privileged architecture. So the privileged architecture, like I said, is going to be a long-running process of, uh, with the kernel, you can add new features over time. The kernel can use the ones that are there um, or uh, go back to an older version. So we, the software community is okay with this. There's a bunch of features that have been requested and what we decided to do is do an incremental 1.12 release that just packages up a lot of relatively small features that people think are useful uh, to bump the privileged architecture. So uh, I won't go down the whole list. Um, a couple I'll pick out are resumable, uh, non-maskable interrupts, uh, putting S time compare as a CSR. Um, and in RV32, a change to SATP to accommodate more modes. So if you understood that, you'll be happy about those things, I think. If you didn't understand it, please, you know, uh, dive in and learn about it. Okay, now we anticipate this stuff should be done by mid-2020, Priv 112. Hypervisor update, um, there's a version of the hypervisor that's been released, the spec 0.5, uh, supports both type one and type two hypervisors. Um, it's already supported in QMU, um, there's KVM, Zen, SEL4 ports underway. Um, 
We are working on defining a, um, a large scale interrupt scheme that supports virtualization. And part of this is thinking about that future server platform that's gonna be very scalable to incredibly large systems. And we're trying to design that in uh, as we do this. Um, so probably by the end of 2020, we may be close to doing ratification on this, but we really need to have some hardware implementations and have these software ports finished and tuned before we close on this. So security is a big deal in uh, uh, RISC V land. We have the Trusted Execution Group have a proposal for improving PMPs to build better containers. The crypto group is working on crypto instructions, both on vectors and on the, just on the X registers if you have a small system. Uh, debug and trace, uh, there's a lot of work there on, now we're enhancing the original 0.13 spec. This is one of those things where there's gonna be continual new features. Um, also on the trace side, we have a new trace format, trying to also reuse portions of the existing Nexus standard uh, in the trace system. Oh, one big thing is a discovery mechanism. People are asking for a way of self-describing hardware. This was something we, we, we fought a lot about in the beginning. It kind of went to the sidelines, now it's come to the fore again. So we need to form a new task group around uh, discovery. Um, and so now, there's a few things we also need to get going. The embedded ABI, we have a proposal, we need a few more people to help drive this, um, to improve the ABI for embedded platforms. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of these. Improving embedded code size, there's a bunch of talks I see at the summit on this. Uh, there's actually a lot of effort this year, and a lot of it went to library code and things, and just improving the current software with the existing instruction set. Now that that's kind of been beaten down, I think it's time to go look at adding more stuff to the ISA to improve the compression further. Um, and the floating point, there's a lot of interest in things like bfloat 16 and half precision, uh, and maybe even posits and stuff. And there's a uh, the sort of call out for volunteers to help drive that, as well as the new uh, IEEE standards committee just closed, and there's a bunch of new operations we may need to integrate. Um, so another thing uh, with creating a new privileged architecture steering committee, there's a bunch of small task groups that we think will be starting up, um, uh, support for larger pages and other virtual memory system enhancements, uh, dynamic physical memory attributes, standardizing those, uh, cache maintenance operations, standardizing those, and standardizing IOMMU, IOPMP. Um, the biggest systems as well. So people are looking at putting proposals together for all these and driving task groups. Okay, so standards is a lot of hard work, it's a lot of fun, um, but we just need a lot of help. So <laughs> need a lot more skilled participation here. Um, there's a very few people, if I look at the percentage of the community that's involved, it's a very small percentage. We like to see a much bigger, I know there's a lot of experts out there, we like to tap into your talent uh, to help drive these forward. Okay, predictions here. You know, we're gonna see a significant investment in high-end RISC-V implementations. Like I said, I think people have been focusing on the IoT embedded side. There's a lot of activity higher up um, in higher performance levels. And so we're trying to lay this ISA and software foundations to support this in all these different, in, in all these different areas. Um, so just to summarize, the core standards are done. That's a big, big milestone. Um, definitely have widespread acceptance. Community keeps growing. Software ecosystem is filling out rapidly and Roboshan is gonna come up right now to tell you about that, um, and we just have to fill in the gaps on the standard side. Lots of work. Okay, Rob, you come up. Okay, um, good morning. Uh, yeah, Rob O'Shea, I'm on the board of RISC-V, and I've been supporting uh, Callista on some of the software strategy uh, going forward. So there's a, there's a lot of work going on in the software working group uh, under the leadership of Arun Thomas. A lot of great progress has been made in areas such as uh, tools, libraries, operating systems, et cetera. But there's still a number of gaps that we need to close. And just like uh, Krista was you know, insinuating about needing help on the specification side, on the standard side, we need a lot of help on the software side as well. And I know, you know the best place to find that talent is right here in this audience. So I'm gonna encourage, here we go. And so uh, we do have an aggressive roadmap for 2020 and, um, and we will be making that more transparent to you so you can see it, you can see where we're going in 2020, what we have planned. Uh, a lot of gaps remain that they're shown here. Uh, what we wanna do is recruit um, talent from this audience to participate, join the working group, help us out. We want to accelerate the ecosystem. This IS, this instruction set architecture is successful as the software and ecosystem support continues to grow. 
Uh, we talked about fragmentation, Chris alluded to it. Uh, I think that's being managed, but we just wanna watch out for that going forward. Uh, that, that, that's always a threat, but I think it's under control right now, like Chris alluded to. Uh, but please uh, think about uh, helping, participating. Uh, we are gonna be reaching out to you with a communication, asking for your um, input on this strategy as well. Please respond to that. Let us know what you're thinking, what you need. Uh, but more importantly, we need your talent. We need your technical expertise to help drive the software ecosystem forward. So just a quick call out on the software side. Thanks for your attention. I'll hand it back. We done? Thank you. Thank you.